The meeting to order. That's a dis is not here, so I'll be here tonight. Um, so first we are going to do a bit of I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. Jacob is so interesting. 
He is hilarious and he likes to take risks. He is constantly trying to think outside the box to solve problems, to add humor, or to be creative in general. He is a steady worker and adds to the classroom environment in a positive way. He always greets me in a personal way and I appreciate that. Last year, he joined the wrestling team and learned some basics of wrestling. By the end of the year, he had a third place finish in the junior varsity con contestant. He has put in a ton of work over the summer in wrestling and I am excited to see the application of his new skills this wrestling season. Jacob has become a wrestling enthusiast and signed up to help others learn the sport by working as a wrestling camp assistant in the community. Jacob also enjoys hiking with his family and hanging out with friends in his free time. Jacob works hard in all his classes maintaining a 3.95 GPA and is someone who can always, you can always look up to. Ms. Farrell says Jacob is a student that teachers and other students respect and admire. He is a natural leader who works well with his classmates and is looked upon as a role model. Jacob is an absolute pleasure to have in class. Mr. Russo, Jacob's PE teacher, agrees with, agrees with this. As he says, Jacob excels in every aspect of PE. He is a hard worker, physically talented, and academically excellent. He never takes a day off and does, all, and does it all while having fun. Jacob is everything a PE teacher, PE teacher could ask for in a class. Great work, Jacob. You have been a bright, you have a bright future ahead of you. Benjamin Thomas. 
Thomas as one of our first June to the Month recipients for the year 2020. Ben has been a model at PJHS with an excellent academic, athletic, and leadership skills. He is highly compassionate and goes the extra mile to help others. Ben was born in nearby Green Bray on April 6, 2006. He has an older sister who is a law student at UC San Francisco and three dogs. He is one of the students who makes school look easy. He excels at putting things together and looks forward to possibly becoming an engineer. With straight A's on his transcript in classes with a curriculum, Ben is setting himself up for success. One of his teachers reflects on Ben's work habits. Ben brings a positive and good work ethic to class each and every day. He is highly reliable. As an athlete, Ben is strong, dedicated, and focused. He has been a valued member of the school's track and field and base basketball team. He also plays baseball in a community sports league and is also into skateboarding. With all of that, though, his primary sport and first love is Taekwondo. Ben has become a Taekwondo master. He traveled all around the country for Taekwondo meets, where he enjoys connecting with competitors from other cities, states, and countries. He is working on becoming the state champion in all eight of his individual events. Ben enjoys helping the younger students in the local Taekwondo day camps and is working to become an instructor. He was also part of his Taekwondo school's demo team and volunteered in the Miracle League. One of Ben's long-term goals is to earn his black belt and open his own Taekwondo school. Community service is Ben's other gift. He is currently an ASB president and served as an officer in the seventh grade. Last year, he was part of the Bantam Buddies and thoroughly appreciated helping new students feel welcome and supported at PJHF. He also returned to the Grant School to help with the annual talent show. Ben Thomas is one of those students who makes life happen. He is a mover and shaker at school and in the community and is a true humanitarian. We are proud to have Ben represent Petaluma Junior High School as a student of the month. He loves reading and learning about history. 
He thinks about others, and through his kindness, he wants to use his skills to support them. As his parents, we are so proud of him. The recognition here and the past from his teachers at Wilson Elementary School are proof that Brayden has the right combination of characteristics to become an exceptional human being. We love him very much. Brayden Breen is one of those students who takes the challenges of school and life head on with courage and integrity. We are pleased to have him represent Petaluma Junior High School as Student of the Month. Agriculture Experience Project and Ag Services. 
She was awarded Star Chapter Green Hand, Star Ch Chapter Farmer, and has received her state FFA degree. She also plans on receiving her American degree in the future. Audrey has been involved in the 4-H program in which she shows market sheep at the county fairs and has been a member of the officer team and has competed, completed many hours of community service through bake sales, helping at dinners, and other events. Audrey has been employed at the Sonoma Marin Veterinary Service since May of her sophomore year, where she performs general vet tech duties, helps customers, manages inventory, and maintains the facility. Audrey's family is the most important thing in her life and loves being with them in her free time. She also enjoys reading, swimming, spending time with friends, and watching football with her dad. In her academic future, Audrey hopes to attend Cal Poly with a major in ag communications and a minor in animal or plant science. With a fondness for agriculture, her dreams to advocate for agriculture industry through journalism and to have a lasting impact in maintaining sustainable agriculture and sustainable future. team playing as the center attacking midfielder. Since his junior year, he has been the captain of, varsity so of the varsity soccer team. In his junior year, he enrolled in five AP classes, while this year he enrolled in six. Outside of school, he helps youth soccer players from Atletico Santa Rosa understand that a balance between soccer and school is key to being successful, to be successful in finding a university that is right for each person. The organization is established in a primarily low-income Hispanic community in which they try to get their goal across of emphasizing the importance of going to college. All his life, he has grown up around soccer and mathematics and sciences have intrigued him. Naturally, Elvis would love to play soccer at UCLA, UC Berkeley, or Stanford, among others, <laughs> while being able to pursue a career in computer science. As a computer scientist, he hopes to make an impact in the world by using the advancing technology to help as many people as possible. Elvis says he owes his success at school to his amazing teachers, coaches, sister, and parents, as well as the influence the great community at Paloma High School has to offer. Cleanup and other activities that help the earth. 
Diego is one of the students that took care of their community by participating in cleanup. Hello, my name is Joseph, and I'm here to tell you about the AHEAD program. AHEAD means academic conversations, hand-on science and mathematics, empathy in a global world, arts and creativity, and development of two languages. The AHEAD program is important for kids' education because it helps the kids learn. I think AHEAD is all important for me because my way of learning is learn while being, being kind to others and having fun. We have four core values, respect, responsibility, compassion, perseverance. Each and every student shows these values and if a teacher sees them doing these values, they'll get a certificate once a month like on the picture. Mm -hmm. These are the principles of the <laughs> The two on the left were the co-principals, Ms. Rodkin and Ms. Shealy. They were the principals when Ms. Anderson on the right was taking care of her newborn. <laughs> Maxfield Bala has made these murals for our school so the kids can get an idea of Maxfield's work as an artist and to help enlighten and brighten our school. I love how vibrant the murals help the campus look and lift the spirits of the students. The murals also help the students learn about the United States to the great world around them. These are the most recent murals done in Ottawa. These murals were on the two touch wall uh, on the back house. The bird, ladybug, ladybug, and other spring animals represent the animals that come in the springtime at the garden. The butterfly references the monarch, which represents this boy in, in its Alaska. Mm -hmm. These are the first murals that Maxfield Wall painted in Michelle. They were inspired by high school seniors from Culture Ground Day. They inspired students to be artistic and educational. The mural on the left shows a half open book with flowers and butterflies coming out. The book shows the education and flowers and butterflies and show the art in the mural. On the right, there is a 1, 2, 3, and ABC for the education. And the caterpillar shows the art with the rainbow. Here is the Santa Rosa Symphony and the music class with Mr. Jen, one of the music teachers at McDowell. And there's also Ms. Cruz and Ms. Rice. On the left is the Santa Rosa Symphony describing the bassoon. Mm -hmm. On the right is Mr. Jen singing with Ms. Wood class. Mm -hmm. And the library is where we check out books for two weeks, and after two weeks, we, um, after two weeks, then we check out new books like on the picture. Mm -hmm. The woman that is sitting now on the yellow seat is a new librarian, Miss Jane, and she's reading to the sick here. When someone doesn't want to play outside on the blacktop, there's a special lunch maker space for kids who want an indoor recess when an outdoor recess is going on in the library. The space includes games like Uno and Monopoly, and coloring pages with a big crate of art supplies. Here are the images of McDowell Garden. And the picture on the right is a picture of the whole garden. On the left is a close-up of one of the trees in the garden with lots of new logs on the tree. If you look closely, you'll see a bird bath and a feeder behind the tree. In the middle of December, every year, we have Fiesta Navideña. It's an evening where the classes come together and sing songs from classics to new songs. I love the fact that we have to sing special songs for the adults and parents. Mm -hmm. In the beginning of the year, the mon these monarchs had no idea how much they would improve and grow as sixth graders. Not until the way they were experienced by the life of a sixth grader. I think we have improved so much myself in everything academic, from writing to mathematics to science. We've learned so much this year at the near junior high. Here's a picture of Ms. Werner and one of the family PTA members of McDowell. There's also Ms. Nealon, Ms. Costello for sixth grade and kindergarten, Ms. Williams, and many more. Blanca and Mary are school associates. They work in the office with Ms. Anderson where they make announcements, take care of kids, and deal with kids who cause problems. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of every school year, we do West Side Relay. That is where sixth graders and fifth graders run different events. The fourth graders also go, but they go to cheer the two classes on. 
Personally, I like running, so I can't wait to go again. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I tell you that you're doing a wonderful job? Oh, I'm so impressed. My yeah. goodness. The slides disappeared, but you guys want to speak over the next one? Yeah. I think that we can just. Yeah. A little <laughs> Sixth grade, we will go to sixth grade camp at springtime. I can't wait to sleep, sleep outside and do archery. Yeah. <laughs> to do archery? Archery. Yeah. Yeah. Many elementary schools don't have Spanish classes, but in our school we do. Uh, many of the students in McDowell are Latinos. Some of them don't speak Spanish. Spanish classes help them out. We even have events that students are joy and they take events Spanish classes. And thank you very much for listening to this slideshow and for being here at this meeting. Do any of you have questions that we can answer? You're all in sixth grade then? Yes. Are you really excited about the end of the year? Yeah. I'll get them. I can see all of you coming to our students at the moment. Yeah. Great job. Yeah. Really good job. Great presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Congratulations. inspires them to give back to their communities, who step forward to tackle the toughest challenges, and preserve to create lasting changes in communities around the world. Together, we empower youth, we improve health, we promote peace, and advance our communities in all corners of the globe. And so with this, I will tell you uh, that our Lend a Hand Education program has been ongoing now for 16 years. Um, and it started out because we felt like teachers were taking money out of their own pockets and using them in the classroom. Uh, so we started out with $100 grants, and now we're up to $250 grants. And I will tell you that this year, in the Petaluma School District, <coughs> we were able to award grants to, let's see, 51 teachers oh. in the Petaluma School District for a total of $11,738. And I know some of the teachers may be here 
tonight. Um, there were some fun grants uh, this year, uh, especially field trips, which usually kind of fall under the radar of most grants. Uh, you know, field trips to Sacramento to learn about our government system, and field tra uh, trips to the symphony as well. Um, and then, of course, some of my favorites uh, as a scientist, a chemist, uh, uh, funding all the STEM programs throughout the school. There was uh, one in particular that was a, kind of a, a brain bin. I think maybe it was at Pedro, but where the kids before school were able to mm -hmm. gather before school and just do all kinds of things. Uh, to keep them occupied. But it really is a pleasure uh, for our Rotary Clubs to work in this community um, and to give back uh, through our fundraisers. And some of these donations to the schools also come from individuals and companies outside of Rotary. And I'm very proud to be here to represent all of them to say thank you again and thank you to all the teachers in this district. Um, you are the key for our children in achieving and, and growing and hopefully all, you'll all be members of Rotary one day. <laughs>
for the magic. Yeah, I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> okay, we're going to begin the meeting again with an update on the governor's state budget proposal for 2020-21 with Chris Thomas. Well, she pulls out the 50-page PowerPoint. Yes. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> While she's pulling that out, I'm handing out copies of the pocket budget. Oh, so interesting. We didn't have those up there. I know, I had to download so them. I had to download them. Well, and thank you very much. I missed that. I was like, what do you mean you don't have them? I know. So before I start, um, we did go to the governor's budget workshop, the governor's budget proposal workshop for 2021 first full budget of the new decade, I might say. Um, and so they always do these school services of California puts on a, a great conference and they do these um, pocket budgets, which is just really helpful to kind of see what some of the highlights are and so on and so forth. Um, in addition, I do have copies, some hard copies of the PowerPoint for those of you that are like me and maybe have eyes that are so oh, sorry. <laughs> So I'll pass these out. Pass those out. That way you can follow follow along and not necessarily try to read all of the numbers that are up on the slide. Okay, now that we have it, so um, see what I mean? It's a little small, and I tried to make the font as big as I could, and it's hard. So anyway. Um, the first thing we'll start with is the COLA. We have a cost of living investment, $1.2 billion in state money toward funding the 2.29% COLA. Um, this COLA was lower from 3%, so back in the adopted budget, they were projecting a 3% COLA for 2021, and now it's been downgraded um, to 2.29. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in the future. What does this mean? We don't get a percentage increase on our revenues. They convert that on an average basis to a dollar amount. So our LCFF base amounts go up by a dollar amount, not by a percentage. And that's important because when they actually do the averages, adjusting for various things, it actually turns out to be closer to 2.14 versus 2.29. Um, so anyway, but the, the increases are 176 PK to 3, 179.46, 184.78, and $214 um, grades 9 through 12. There is $645 million um, in this budget proposal for ongoing increases to the special education phase. Now, each SELPA is very different, and this is to bring SELPAs up to a statewide average or up to a, 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 about, of course, an average is a good new target. So um, I understand that our Sonoma County SELPA actually already may, may, may be close to that statewide average or even possibly above it. So how much this actually equates to in Sonoma County and then ultimately to us as a district, I'm not really sure. But I'm hearing that the Sonoma County itself might not get a whole lot of this money. But we'll find out more as we, as we move further. There are actually some selfies that are above the statewide average. And will they get any money? Will they at least get the COLA? Those are some of the questions that are being grappled with right now. And that's some of the information that hopefully will come out of committee ultimately uh, into the state budget. So that's kind of a wait and see. There is about $250 million in one-time funding for preschoolers with disabilities. Um, and so, again, we need a lot more information on what that looks like. This would be more restricted funding, specifically for that target group. Okay. So this just takes a look at what is our current base for 1920 by grade span, K3, 4, 6, 7, 8, and 9, 12. And then applying those dollar amounts we just talked about over 2.29% COLA. And then what our new adjusted base would be if these numbers end up being the actual numbers in the state budget. So we would be just under 7,900 or 7,878 as a base for K3, 7,997 for 4, 6, 8,234 for 7, 8, and 9,543 for 9, 12. This does not include the career ticket or the base fan adjustment. This is the base before that. And this doesn't include supplemental or concentration fan. So remember, Supplemental, you get 20% on top of the base. Concentration grant, which we're not eligible for, that's 
that's over 55% pretty reduced or your unduplicate account, that's a 50%. So picture, take four through six of close to 8,000 rounded. If you got 50% in concentration, you're getting an additional $4,000 on right. top of that. Right. Or 20%, which is significantly less. So that's where districts that are getting concentration grant dollars are actually getting a lot more funding for students. So this is kind of an aside. Okay, some of the other highlights other than the cost of living adjustment. Um, there is an increase in the state portion of the school nutritional funding from 25 cents, don't hold your breath, to 33.5 cents per meal. That represents a very small portion of our nutritional budget, our food service budget, but it is an increase that they're recommending nonetheless, so we'll take whatever yeah. pennies we can get. Um, there is a 2.29% call on the mandated block grant, so remember, we get those mandated block grants every year. Um, we got that one-time mandated money that went away last year. We had gotten that for about five years in a row, and that went away last year. But they are um, they are suggesting a COLA on the mandated block grant, so that's a good thing. That's an ongoing COLA. There is no relief for pension increases. Um, the STRS increase is slated to be go from 17.1 to 18.4. That's a 1.3%. The PERS rate um, right now is slated to go from 19.721 to 22.8, or over a 3% increase. We now, saw the STIRS kind of coming, right? But not the STIRS. I remember PERS. Yeah, we're going to show, I'm going to show you a little bit more on PERS in a minute, but the STIRS increase is in, is in statute. Right. Now, this year's budget included a little bit of money to kind of bring that down from the 18.1 it was right. supposed to be to 17.1. Right. And remember right. the adopt in the May revise, we thought it was going to be 16.7. Right. And then the adopted budget ended up being 17.1. Mm -hmm. So we have a long way to go before we get to the, the actual state right. budget. But as a starting place, we know in statute it's supposed to be 18.4. Now PERS, the PERS board makes these decisions right. um, about the PERS rate increases, but currently they're looking at a 3% increase or going up by 3%. So that's a very sizable increase, mm -hmm. one of the most sizable that we've seen as our rates go. And just for some historical perspective, the STRS increase, the STRS rate for years, decades, 8.25%. 8 so this is more than double yeah. what that was. And then the PERS rate was anywhere from 0 to 13.02% historically. So we now are looking at well over 20%. Yeah. Um, so for every dollar we pay somebody, we pay 100, it costs us $120, uh, $120, $1.27, $1.27. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so for every $100, it costs us $120. Yeah. And then there is $250 million, like I said, set aside for some restrictive preschoolers with disabilities, and we'll hopefully get more information as, as the process goes on. So this is the PERS, this just shows where the PERS rate is supposed to go over the next eight years. Um, so currently, 1920, 19.721, they're projecting it to go as high as 26.7%. So again, for every $100, we would pay out $126, almost $127. So it's a pretty significant increase. That used to be what the total driven cost altogether was. So remember, we pay Social Security, Medicare, Workers' Comp, SUI on top of this. So right. the actual driven cost for classified salaries will end up being, or, or certificate, depending on if you're, some certificate staff are in FERS as well. Right. Um, it's going to be well over 35, 35 to almost 40 percent, mm -hmm. not including all the water. Yes. So these are significant impacts. And this is why when you see up and down the state of California, there's a lot of school districts that are struggling, either closing schools, or having massive budget cuts. I know that San Francisco is facing significant, I heard 60 million on that, the right, budget cuts. Um, Sacramento struggling, Oakland struggling, West Contra Costa struggling. I mean, many of the districts, even Napa is doing some, doing it for some pretty some serious layoffs. So many of the districts around us and Petaluma were all struggling mm -hmm. with these stirs and purse increases. And I will just say, this is not a, a problem created by our staff. Our staff deserve their pensions and, and you know are not paid enough. So this is not because any of our staff have done anything wrong or because of our district. This is this is based on decisions that were made at the state level many years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Coming on the roots. What's not in the budget? 
So there's no increase of CFF targets. So you know we've been pushing on the governor and the state for a while now that the base is not enough. That if someone's getting eight thousand dollars, we're getting eight thousand dollars according to this budget proposal. In concentration grant districts are getting twelve thousand dollars. The base is not enough. It needs to be higher. There's no increase to LCFF targets or base amounts in this budget. Payments to reduce the stores, Cal stores and Cal purse costs. There's no money to reduce it. I know there's some, there was some confusion, but the state budget has set some money aside to help buffer, if you will, the increases so that increases aren't as significant. Right. So instead of 18.1 in stores this year, it was 17.1. So that was the money kind of set right. aside. It still was a significant increase, just not as significant. Right. There's no money to increase the LCFF to say, hey, in, in, um, in order to help districts out to offset some of these costs, we're going to increase the base. None of that. And no more one time discretionary grants. So, those, remember, we had those for five years, five or six years. We did not get any of the share, and there's nothing in the proposal for next year. So, we are now living in a COLA-only world. And what does that mean? You know, for, for the last, um, really since 12-13, we were living in a gap funding world, where we got COLA and we got gap funding. And then for the past five or six years, in addition to that, we got one-time money. So we were living in a world in which we were getting additional money over and above the cost of living adjustment. And that was helping us address some of the stirs and first increases and other increases that we've seen. We are now in a cost of living adjustment only world. We got 3.26% cost of living adjustment this year, and we got very little other one-time money. And the same is true for next year. And so, again, our second year with little to no unrestricted one-time money. The COLA is becoming very volatile. So, again, in the adopted budget, it was projected to be 3%. In November, the LAO, the Legislative Analyst Office, was projecting it at 1.79%, and now it's at 2.29. So what does that say? It says this is a usually our starting point for starting to develop our budgets next year, but really, given this level of volatility, we have no idea what the May revise is going to end up being, much less the final state adopted budget. So it's kind of a wait and see game, but this level of volatility, there's a significant difference in revenues for us between 3% and 1.79. Is it usually having that much volatility? It hasn't for some time. Okay. It, it has in the past, sure. but it has been sometimes. Have they okay. explained what is driving that volatility? It's, just, it's the uncertainty in the markets of state revenue yeah. up and down. You know, the COLA, or the cost of living investment, is in statute. So it's by formula, basically, in law. And so by April, hopefully, we'll have a good idea. But then sometimes the governor comes in and then they augment or they take away, depending on Prop 98, this the COLA for this over Prop 98, under Prop 98. So they, the COLA is in statute, but they can say what we're going to apply to the LCFF can be different than the statutory COLA. So the COLA right now is very volatile because of a lot of factors going on in the state of California mm -hmm. and elsewhere. Um, remember, they're just predicting what are revenues going to be in April, what they don't know for sure. So they're, project, they're projecting those revenues, which kind of then changes what they're projecting for the COLAs. So next year's COLA is based on this year's revenues, which they won't know until April. That's when they look at it. So um, the COLA, that three, that 2.29% then becomes the only new revenues that we're receiving on the LCFF to cover things like step and column costs, the PERS and STRS increases. Property liability insurance has become a huge mm -hmm. issue for us. We call that we got a 34% increase in property liability last year. Mm -hmm. Last year to this year, $190,000 our property liability went up. Is that, are we seeing that across the state or is that more in areas where there have been fires? And it's really across the state because it's having a, a global impact on the insurance market. Because insurers usually don't just insure here, right. but but certainly we're getting impacted here for, for sure because of our utilization of insurance. And sure. Usually it's based at least in part on, on what losses they've seen. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what our insurance is going to do next year, but we're pretty sure we'll, we'll probably see double digit increases again. We'll know more in May when RESIG adopts their new rates based right. on 
on their reinsurers and so on and so forth. So those are just some of the risks that we're paying attention to. So we're also anticipating special education cost increases. So we know that SCO's current rate per student, not per ADA, but per student, um, that they educate our students in their programs, 47500 right now. It's well over $1.2 million for us at this point. Um, we're anticipating double-digit increases again next year. That <coughs> increase at $47,500 represented just over a 13% increase. And we're anticipating that. There's a lot of districts pulling back program from SCO because of these large increases. The, the challenge is that then creates larger increases because they have fixed costs right. that it's not they cannot reduce as quickly as the program um, the programs that they're losing. So we're anticipating at least a fifty thousand dollar per student price tag. It could be higher than that if we see thirteen percent increases. And remember, they're also covering those PERS and SIRS, or I should say. We're also covering their person service increases as well. Changes in the meal program legislation that's restricting our ability to um, for districts to collect lunch money. So that we're not sure what this um, challenge is going to create, but that's one of the risks that we're looking at. Remember, we get two million dollars in parcel tax. That parcel tax money funds mostly salaries and benefits. We're not getting any cost of living adjustment on the parcel tax. So as we're seeing increases, the FERS and SERS and seven column and whatnot, we don't get any additional money on the parcel tax to help cover those types of increases. And then fuel cost volatility. You know, that fuel cost has been very volatile. We know what's happening in the Middle East can drive or, or impact fuel prices here. Um, and so it may be time for us to consider charging for bus passes again. We haven't done that in several okay. years, but that may be one of the things that I think. I know I think. For my daughter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they have so to kind of highlight this graphic, what does this all mean? So the blue bar, you can see 1920, 2021, 21, 22, 22, 23. The blue bar represents the base. That's our base funding. The orange bar is concentration or supplemental grants for us, student concentration. And then the red bar is basically. Um, step in column estimated. This is based on statewide averages. This is not federal amount. It's based on statewide averages, and it's illustrated. It's for illustrative purposes. Step in column costs represent over hundred dollars. They're assuming here. Then you've got the stirs rate increase, which represents roughly sixty-eight dollars. This is all based on per ADA. Doesn't even know what special ed costs are going to be. And so, when you look at 1920, you can see that the base and the supplemental is covering our new costs, with special ed, of course, being the huge question mark, right? But look at 2021, when you're only getting 2.29%, then all of a sudden your base is significantly lower, your, your supplemental grants are significantly lower, and the STRS and PERS rate increases are bigger. And so all of a sudden, our new costs are outpacing, potentially, our new revenues. And that becomes a challenge for us as we look at things like property and liability and making sure that we have adequate funds to provide raises for our staff. So those are just some of the challenges. When we say we're in a COLA-only world, this is the type of situation where it creates deficit spending on a structural level. And then you can see how 2021-22 looks and then 22-23. Um, and of course, the further out you go, the less uncertain it is whether it's the cost increases or the revenue increases. So we don't really know. But this kind of gives you, when I'm talking about a COLA only world, and we're only getting that amount of new revenue, and then we have all of these new costs, how are the new costs outpacing the new revenue? And this does not even factor in things like parcel tax, right. not receiving. How much COLA or how many increase, how much an increase is will receive with special education revenue? get significant special ed revenues. Where does that factor in? This is simply looking at it from an LCFF perspective. So kind of looking at that from a different angle. So now looking at it with a different graphic. So if the costs represent $313 per ADA, and the revenues are $231 per ADA on average, 
then $82 per ADA are unfunded of the new costs. And again, this is looking on a statewide average. We have a long way to go to develop our budgets. But for planning purposes, this is really important for us to understand that in this budget proposal, the new money does not is not adequate to cover the potential new costs that we have that are generally outside of our control. Right. We don't get to decide how much the person serves rates are going to be. You know, workers comp, we don't get to decide those rates either, but we can somewhat control our risks by doing a better job yeah. managing tripping hazards and doing training for our maintenance and custodial staff and that type of thing. At least we can, we have some power to help mitigate that risk, but with stirs and purrs, we really have no power to do anything other than legislative purposes. So basically, 231 represents the new revenues under the LCFF. 313 represents the new cost, which is the whole pie, and the $82 represents the part of the pie that's not funded. And that would generally have to come out of our reserves, or you make enough cuts to cover the new costs in other areas. So, any questions on what I've done so far? No, we stop. I have one. Um, was there any indication of, I didn't see uh, anything in here about the um, bond measures in the March ballot. Was there any assumptions about that built into this the governor's budget? You mean parcel tax or bond? Bond. Talk about the state's state state state, bond. No, there wasn't any assumptions on that. Yeah, I mean, there's some facilities proposals out there, but nothing concrete. There's lots of stuff that we're tracking. So, pass or doesn't pass, it wouldn't affect. I, I didn't see anything in here. It that, doesn't, because mostly what we're presenting tonight is the potential impact on the general fund. But right. you're right, there's a whole, we, our goal, will be to be shovel-ready shovel, shovel ready with things like whether it's looking at our solar or looking at other projects so if there is funding that we're ready to go. So that's kind of the conversation we're having is being um, shovel-ready. By shovel-ready I mean that we've got plans approved that we're kind of ready to go. We may even, it's, it's kind of like the E-rate funding. We proceeded with the E-rate project using leveraging our bond money in anticipation of getting E-rate. And now we're starting to get the E-rate reimbursements in. Mm -hmm. But we moved forward with our bond money knowing we were leveraging that right. to get the E-rate funding. So it may be the same thing with the state bond. I think you were, he was referring to the election. I think you're referring to the initiative, not the bond. Is that what is you this the, one? Is this Proposition 13? No, 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 no. That, that one is a poll. Uh, no, there's a, is there a bond? The on capital, bond? capital okay. projects. Yeah, there are facilities. Oh, there's a capital project bond. There's also another. There's also another educational initiative. Yeah. Uh, that's on the. It's on the ballot. Not the access. <laughs> but what I'm hearing is the, the, the governor's proposal no. so far is doesn't. It would be effective. Yeah. So where's so where did the money go? Because we're we're doing yeah. really well, uh, relatively speaking, in the state. Where, yeah. where where the money went? The short version is that they're building up their rainy day fund. Always, even though it's yeah. raining. So, <laughs> the rainy day fund, there's a significant increase in the allocation into the rainy day fund, um, and that's that's where he's, you know, recommending placement. You know, the, 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 the summary version is the governor uh, took a, a, a very Jerry Brown very st stance on the budget, and he wants to make sure that um, should we do go into a recession that we're not looking at reductions in education spending? So, according to this, it says the state budget does not include any significant new initiatives for school facilities. It does address some of the preschool funding. So some of the preschool funding um, is, there is some funding for the construction of preschool facilities. So we actually are applying for some of that grant money. Actually, I should say we have applied, right. and um, they're hoping to they push the release of that information to February. Melinda Susan was just sharing with me this morning, so we have applied for that. Um, but there's very little in the state budget as far as school facilities goes. They're selling some more bonds, about 1.5 billion in Prop 51 bonds. They're going to be selling, but that's more of the cash and funding. It's not really any authorization. So. Any other questions? 
So where do we go from here? We've got all this information. Um, where do we go from here? The Basically, January 10th, the governor comes out and introduces the state budget proposal for the upcoming budget, which in this case is 2021. Um, and then the budget bill is introduced into both houses shortly thereafter. And then in February, the trailer bills start getting released, et cetera. Um, obviously, we wait until April to see how are the revenues coming for the state. And once we get through the April revenue collections, because you know that's when we pay all of our taxes generally is in April, then all of a sudden they'll come out with the cost of living adjustment, the statutory cost of living adjustment, and the governor will come out with his May revise to this budget proposal based on all the new information that they've collected between now and April. And then once that happens, they go into budget committees. So once the May revise comes out, then that revision to his budget proposal goes into the budget committees at the state level. And then by June 15th, by statute, they have to have an approved budget ready for the governor to review and hopefully sign. And of course, he has blue line veto power, et cetera. So by July 1st, we have a state budget. So that's kind of the process. In the meantime, we're now going into continuing to collect information like property and liability insurance. We're immediately going into enrollment projections. We're already starting to do our enrollment projections um, because, of course, that drives staffing, preliminary staffing projections. It, pro it drives ADA projections, which that you, you know leads to how we're projecting our revenue. Um, and so that's kind of where we are. We're in the preliminary phases of budget development, and that's kind of where we start, like I said, we've already started having this conversation, so. Any questions? Have our state senator or assembly member reached out to us at all and like asked our thoughts are they champion education? Champion education? Because I don't think they are. I have not heard from them. I I, I know Jared Huffman, which was a former assembly right. person, um, but he's now at the federal level, right. so he's now a congressman. So I, I have not okay. heard from mm -hmm. our. Have they helped us in the past few years at all? No, that's my thought. Just yeah. on the record. Thomas said yeah. Yep. Other questions? Does it seem to be? Do you have any idea why they, he went Jerry Brown? Are they anticipating something? Can they? I mean, does it feel like they're seeing something in the economy? Um, I mean, everyone's preparing for a recession. Four so more years of Trump the, is probably yeah. what they're worried about. <laughs> We're in the we are in the longest period of a non-recession. However. The um, UCLA the longest recovery on record. Yeah. The UCLA forecast yeah, but the says was like one of the worst. Right? They, the UCLA forecast said uh, they were anticipating a gross national product of a th what they call three percent, two percent next year, one percent the following year. They have revised theirs to be three two two. So, in the immediate future, they're not anticipating a recession. Um, the numbers that the governor is using are fairly, fairly um, conservative, though. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I don't know if they, I think part of the challenge is because there are some initiatives, education initiatives, on the ballot that will probably hurt us in the short run because they'll be like, "Well, let's see what happens with those with those right. ballot initiatives." They're going to punt it like to see if the, to the split rule. I believe that's the, the title of it: the split rule ballot. So we'll see what happens with those. I think that I think that Governor Newsom is playing it safe, and I, I think that most you know they did not really predict the last Great Recession or the last recession mm -hmm. we had. They certainly didn't predict how um, uh, how deep the recession is going to be. And you're right, it was the longest recovery on record, but the first four or five years was also one of the slowest recoveries right. on record. That usually we recovered. A, of a pace of about 3%, and we were in the 1, 1.5, 2% for a long time. So it was a very slow recovery. Um, I will also just remind ourselves that only in 18, 19 will we really restore to pre recession right. yes. level revenues. Right. So adjusted for inflation, of course. Right. And so, you know, the districts, and I, and I don't mean to belabor the point, but the districts that get concentration grant funding mm -hmm. were restored far. 
far faster at a much higher level. And we are not one of those districts. And so we need to continue to push on the fair and full funding concept. Right. Um, especially for us as being one of the 200 right. districts in the state that are still below the state right. average. Well, then there's also the basic aid districts. Yeah, I'm not that even talking about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I do think that there is um, a sense that, you know, as I learned in economics, what goes up must come down. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a matter of... We haven't even gone up enough. But here's the thing, if we're experiencing challenges and we're at least still getting colas and we're not getting recession, that's what makes me nervous. When we're looking at being upside down on the average 313 versus 284 and we're, and we're short $82, and that's not projecting a recession. Right, right. So the whole idea of the rainy day fund and the whole idea of making sure we have adequate reserves, it buys you time to be able to adjust. Um, once, once that does hit. So I'll just say that you look around, and I, as I mentioned to you, there's a lot of districts out there that are struggling and that are having to make serious cuts, and we're not in a recession. That's disconcerting. So we need to move cautiously, and we need to move somewhat conservatively. So. Yeah. Fun times. Thank you very much. All right, comments from the public. We have two people that will be talking. I, I'm going to read this one, you know, the uh, kind of rules, and then um, I'm only going to read it once. And I don't have my glasses, so. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. Hopefully, hopefully it's checking out the cost. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so much better. <laughs> <laughs> Under government code and it's yeah. yeah. I know five four nine five four point three A. Members of the public have the right to address the governing board on any items of interest providing it relates to the subject matter jurisdiction of the school district. In accordance with board policy um, BP nine three two three, each speaker is allocated a total of four minutes to address the board for a maximum of 20 minutes on each subject matter. While the above reference government code allows speakers to criticize the district's policies, procedures, programs, services, and or employees, the district doesn't, does have a current policy, BP and AR 1312.1, specific to complaints against employees. Should comments from the public pertain to a specific district employee, the board requests that the complaint first be submitted in writing to the employee's immediate supervisor for investigation. The board does not take action or discuss items not appearing on the agenda. Uh, the board values public comments and wishes to convey that although the board members cannot discuss issues or items that are not on the agenda, they listen carefully and appreciate and value input from the public. Okay, Loretta. On fairness at the table. Huh? Fairness at the table. Yes. Hello. Hello. Hi. My name is Loretta Cruz Maggie, CSEA Chapter President. Here to address the board briefly and with some <coughs> updates. As you know, we are currently working to negotiate our next contract, which as it stands is expired. Some issues we brought forth are fair and equitable salary increases that address cost of living fair and equitable contributions to our health and welfare premiums, training for new and existing employees. We urge the board to implement meaningful solutions to our concerns as they directly impact the quality of education we offer students here at PCS. The district's most recent salary proposal was 2.5% across the board. This is significantly less than what was settled with the teachers and does not address the disproportionate impact stagnant wages have on our members. 2.5% across the board is an increase of about 33 cents for our lowest paid employees. It doesn't bring our lowest paid position to $15 an hour. Equally important, it doesn't adequately address the need for higher increases across the board. Healthcare, housing, and other basic necessities continue to rise for all of us. 2.5% is not enough to keep us in the communities we serve. 
Many of us have children here. Another related point of concern, the district frequently hires above range C, which means after a few years, employees max out on the salary schedule. It also results in employees who started from at the beginning of the salary schedule being paid at the same rate as a newly hired employee because newly hired employees won't be swayed to take positions. We believe this has a negative effect on long-term retention. Equally troublesome is the fact that over the summer in the, the district proposed raising the substitute rate, so substitutes oftentimes make more hourly than permanent employees. We are concerned about the use of certificated substitutes who are paid over $100 a day to work to fill classified vacant, vacant classified positions or to substitute in them. At our last session, when we voiced our concern that it had been years, since 2013 to be exact, since the district increased their contribution to our health and welfare benefits. In fall, the district expressed publicly with its initial proposals that it had an interest in negotiating a fair increase to health and welfare benefits for employees, but during our first session, your team proposed no increase. When we pushed on this again, the solution your legal counsel inform, informally proposed was to split the 2.5% raise for all employees they originally proposed so that 1.5% would go towards salaries and a 1% increase to the health and welfare premium. Seeing as my time is limited, I'll pause here, but I will leave with these two thoughts. Schools would not run without our labor. We are vital to our students and vital to our communities. Who would clean classrooms, ensure our students are fed, safe in the playgrounds, help provide supporting classrooms for our diverse student population? We deserve to be treated fairly and with respect, take our concerns and positions seriously and negotiate. A familiar argument is that funding is always an issue. But our reserves have grown every year. We meet the state requirement and some. We are also supportive of the schools and communities. First ballot initiative, which if passed next fall, will increase funding for schools. We are working to collect signatures to get this on the ballot. We love our schools. We love our communities. We're not interested in bankrupting the district. Work with us. Let's find a solution. And I didn't make enough copies for all of the board, but I wanted to um, share with you a couple times ago when our proposals first went, I shared with you that night how many of those positions were hired at the FSTA. Uh, we have asked the district for information, which, which they have given us, for the last two years of positions being hired. And as you can see by this graph, it's mostly in the F position. When all of us are hired that work in public city schools, it's all public information. This is for you guys. So anybody can see what people make. Right. I heard today that we have an instructional assistant leaving because she had to train somebody who's making more than her. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, Sarah Andropolis, Andropolis. Did I say this? Close enough. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really having a hard time. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm Sarah Gopalas. I'm part of Hellema Tide and um, North Dale Beach with my families. And I just wanted to submit kind of a brief like, comment or sort of question about the, um, the record of suspension, removal of record of suspension, second reading that's up for, I guess, before it's, I guess, uh, I guess it'll be possibly approved by, uh, as part of the consent agenda. And so um, I understand from the last board meeting that a lot of the motivation with putting this forward is, is sort of to promote equity and so just one qu question um, that I had was if limiting the expungement um, sort of remedy to students who only have one suspension in their high school um, career might serve to sort of maintain or further kind of existing disparities with respect to you know students who tend to be suspended at higher rates than others which tend to be students of color students with disabilities um, some research shows LGBTQ plus students as well um, and so just in the event that you might have students with one or more suspension that kind of possibly shouldn't be there in the first place, maybe they should have the same opportunity to seek expungement mm -hmm. depending on the circumstances. So my question was just whether PCS had considered, maybe it's already been considered, um, or if it would be open to considering sort of broadening the language of the rule a little bit to just maybe allow for case-by-case -case review of requests mm -hmm. for expungement of suspension records. Um, just in, in case you, you have you know a student who you know perhaps had a, you know a, a learning difference or something that was not being adequately addressed or a mental health diagnosis that hadn't been made and mm -hmm. you know or students who are experiencing you know disciplinary outcomes as a result of implicit bias you know mm -hmm. students of color again 
uh, tend to experience um, suspension of the disciplinary actions at higher rates. And so, um, yeah, so I guess that's just sort of um, uh, my, my question. And I remember that part of the reasoning um, last week that was discussed for why you'd want to sort of limit it to one um, suspension in terms of who can seek expungement was that you would create an incentive, I guess, for students to not run into trouble again. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one way of looking at it. I think maybe another way of looking at it is that if you have a student who has their second sort of incident, then they, they might feel like looking at this rule, well, and now I have zero incentive to like try to like not run into any sort of trouble anymore. So that, I think that's just kind of another way of considering it. Um, and then just one final note in the discussion um, last week, I, I just I noticed that in terms of um, repeat um, suspensions, the term recidivism was being used, and so I just would uh, respectfully encourage maybe thinking about sort of the, the sort of the criminal justice system connotations with that sort of terminology, and the I'm sure awareness everybody has of the um, literature around the school to prison pipeline mm -hmm. and things like that, and just kind of maybe um, considering um, yeah how to sort of word that kind of stuff in that context. I think that's, that's all. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Sarah. Thank you. Okay. So I have the signature sheets for the schools and community first, if anybody hasn't signed it. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, report on activities and um, correspondence at the school board. Thank you also for the public comment. Um, uh, San Antonio High School award ceremony, oh, that was awesome. and uh, office hours at Casa Grande. So, all good. <laughs> um, uh, so now we have the approval of the consent agenda by consolidated motion. I want to have somebody make a motion oh, yeah. on 9.3.3 that we have a, a, a date that uh, for an overnight field trip that for HOSA that's actually April 1st through 5th. So if we can get a, a motion to it. I move to pull 9.3.3 for discussion. It just has to change the date. Yes. 9.3.3. Just modify it, just to modify well, we it. Pull it to amend it. Oh. oh, you have to pull it to amend it? Right. Like, yeah. You can do it. Yeah, that, that's the cleanest way. Okay, so we'll, do I have, have a motion. I have a motion. I did the motion. <laughs> okay. Do we have a second? A second. Great. Okay. Uh, so now we're on the table. I, I move to amend to the dates to April 1st through 5th so that they go at the right time. <laughs> they don't show up four days early. <laughs> okay. Uh, any discussion? Or no, there still needs to be a second, and then there's and discussion. then a second. Okay. A second. A second. And then a discussion. No. Yeah. Okay. Good. Cool. Okay. So then we just all pass that one. All in the whole thing. All in favor. All in favor. Okay. All in favor. Aye. 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 Now go back to. The now we go back to the approval <laughs> of the consent agenda by consolidated motion. Uh, I want to pull what Sarah was talking about, 9.4.1, mostly because I wasn't here last time, and I want to ask about the question Sarah raised. Okay. Second? Yeah, I'll, I'll second that. Okay. Uh, discussion? Well, Liz, you heard what Sarah said, so I'm not going to repeat it, but have we done any research in, on that? Um, I also wasn't here last time, so just hearing again the reason why we landed on one, I would just love to know. Right. So it was just uh, the committee went through discussion. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, and, and Sheldon asked last time, what does a suspension on a student's record do? Right. And the fact of the matter is, not a whole lot. And when the student graduates, it's just their records are, you know, yeah. done. They're sealed up. They don't get passed along. Mm -hmm. There's very few private schools that will actually ask about a student's record. Mm -hmm. They don't ask at the CSU UC system. Right. Um, so it was more of just a, um, we do, once there was one line in all of our board policy that said it could be expunged, mm -hmm. with no criteria around that. So we got together at the committee and we said what my criteria looked like. So we looked at what other districts do, we looked at Oakland Unified, we looked at Tam Unified, and we kind of put together language, pieces of both, um, and, and talked as a committee. And so the idea around one of the high school career was, 
we know, you know, K-8 students may make, you know, multiple things may happen, and so we were really just looking at, you know, those, those people will never, never really look back on anyways, but what was happening is just based on that one line, some families were sure. saying, hey, can we get that expunged? While well, others weren't aware it existed. So we thought we'd put that in the language and we'd be very specific what the criteria were, and we'd send letters if a student gets a suspension, letting them know what this is about. And so the reason we landed on one is because, I, I mean, we could open it up to any number. We could say four or five, but I think one is just, I, I would be concerned yes. that if we if we didn't have a set number, if we said, but oh, we'll consider in other cases, we would run up yes. against the same issue in that those who wanted us to consider in other cases and, you know, pulled in legal would be the ones getting considered while other students may not pursue more than the one. So I don't, that's why yes. I said number, but ultimately it would be, you know, up to up to the board to decide if, if you wanted to bump that up or say, but in other cases we'll consider it. I just worry that that would lead to the same slippery right. slope that the initial language had. Am I right that this, um, if I'm reading this right, it's uh, the parent or guardian that can request up to one. Does it in any way limit uh, an administrator, site administrator, or from reviewing the whole, for looking at more? No, it does. It doesn't. But but it would be parent, guardian, or student themselves okay. who can request their senior year. Right. Um, if it, if there was a principal who said, you know, and we can we can review this one as well, just knowing your situation, or you know, and Sarah made brought up a good point about you know if you found out later on that there was there was more going on right. when all this was happening, there would be nothing to preclude a site administrator from saying we can we can do more. Again, I yeah. And I hate to say it like as though the site administrator may be biased, but that's part of you know what sometimes leads to that slippery slope and, and why we wanted the definition in the first place is because some would get it and some wouldn't. And so the specificity around the language was so that we don't have it where some get it and some don't. Yeah. Um, but again, the you know the number could shift. There we weren't stuck on a number. We were just more stuck on. We want to make sure everyone knows it's consistent yeah. and everyone knows that they have that opportunity. Yeah. What about an appeal? Is there any kind of um, process where somebody in their senior year gets that second one? Mm -hmm. um, is there a, a, any kind of process? I, I don't remember the, um, the policy mm -hmm. for appealing it for expungement. So again, right now, that would, right now it's just right the now one. the way it's laid out is if you have one over the yeah. course of your nine twelve okay. years, and then you get that expunged, and you make that um, request as a senior, right? Right, you, you make that request as a senior. Are you the one that they appeal? Yeah. They appeal, right? They write the letter. It goes to me, and then it, and then ultimately to all of you, it comes right. to the board to say like, yes, you know, they've written the letter. They, you know, and again, it could be. The concern is on the other end, you know, I, I totally hear what Tara says, and the concern on the other end is, does that lead to the same issue of then those who want to pursue it and are gonna try to say like, well, can't we do a second one? Can't we do a third one? That they'll push harder where there's others who may be more disenfranchised or not feel, yeah. I, I don't know, I don't know if it leads to the same slippery slope if we put in that kind of gray language. Mm -hmm. Um, or we could not do that policy at all and just leave that one line in there. And, I think, no, I think you know, this is like uh, an yeah. improvement. Yeah, yeah definitely. We, we need the improvement. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean no, I something to try. Time, so to get. We yeah. don't have, don't have any process. Yeah. relatively speaking, when you look at numbers and you look at numbers of students getting suspended and who's getting we don't have a lot of suspensions for the number of students that we have. So when they, you know, I'm not sure we've actually crunched the numbers, but I but it's well over 90% of our students never get suspended from school. So there's a really small, we're dealing with a really small pool, I guess, of students. And that when we talk about suspensions that happen in high school, um, that is that's a an exception in in most situations, in most high schools at that particular age. You know, we more often will see see some um, juvenile types of behavior at the junior high school level versus the high school level. Um, 
and maybe that's maturation. But you know, we, you know, when we start looking back at past data, it seems like most of the situations that we are at, that we have deal with a single situation that's a stain on a record that's otherwise unblemished, not even, not even true, not even a truancy. You know, it's a clean record, and there's just one incident that occurs. So, I don't know. Okay, so then we vote on the polling of it. Well, it's already no, been we've already done. It's already okay. so we should so now we can just vote on it. Yeah, but we have to vote on it separately. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we will vote on. Um, a, there's no amendment to it. Right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the. The approval of the, oh no, that's just part of the. So we need a motion to approve. Yeah, I move to approve it. But one. we're approving it later. No, I pulled it off the consent. So you're approving consent? Approving okay, consent. Approving, 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 consent. approving consent of the 9.4.1 Newport policy, second reading of BP 5144.3, removal of suspension record. All in favor? Now you want to approve the, the oh, remainder of the now, consent agenda. Okay, okay. so now I need a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Okay. Discussion? I have a question about the Chromebooks for mm -hmm. Curve DM and Sonoma Mountain. Are they just now getting their, I don't know, who do I ask? Dave, did I use? <laughs> Are they just now getting their Chromebooks? The high school, that, at that high school? So they've been using a similar two-in-one Chromebook ahead mm -hmm. of the other high schools. Oh, okay. and, and those, though they're not at the end of life, the ones that they're using, mm -hmm. just to put them at an even footing with okay. what was deployed in other schools, we're going to reissue the ones that they're using mm -hmm. um, elsewhere for testing okay. and give them the same model. Okay. So, so they have been, they've had, had yes. two-in-one. They, yeah, they've had okay. a two-in-one. So sure. they, they had one yeah. 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 two yeah. years ago. Yeah. Right. I was wondering about um, that. So these are for for Kenilworth uh, and Petaluma Junior, and then also for the elementary schools. So are we going to have the same? So this is for the pilots. So are we going to have the same process of um, you know a, a study session around the technology at the different levels, so that you'd have one for the junior highs and then one for the elementary. I guess my concern is that it seems like elementary needs, um, there's, just, there's just a lot of uh, concern about how the one-to-one -one devices were, was decided in the first place. So I want to make sure that the parents, teachers, everybody has significant input in, in where this pilot goes. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I was just wondering about the process after the pilot. So we have the pilot for a year? Uh, no, so we'll be piloting uh, for a period of months in different classrooms. We're you know, attempting to have all the elementary sites be able to pilot as well as the junior high sites. Um, and that's one, just one part of the process, working with the Learning Innovation Committee as we did with the high school as well. And absolutely, we'll be seeking public input and having the opportunity through survey and through in-person events, whether that takes the form of a study session, if that's what the board would like to do, or I'm planning also outside of that, if that doesn't become a possibility, to have some sort of events to have the public be able to come in and provide feedback on the program and hear about what we've been doing um, and look at potential changes. And so the pilot is of the Chromebooks is to look at the possibility of using different devices uh, if that's what should come out of that part of it um, at those levels. So we anticipate that the process with the junior high will be more like consistent with the process that we did at the high school level. The process at the elementary has a whole nother uh, caveat to it that's going to have to involve some more discussions about developmental issues and, and through um, outreach with parents yeah. and so that's going to be a little bit of a slower process yeah. but if we can get their get devices in their hands that will also help them in, in the ultimate decision right so when is the pilot taking place it's not next school year it's starting this now. school year will be in uh, at those grade levels in certain classrooms so uh, 
to be, to be able to to uh, to test the you know the, those devices and efficacy of using those devices at those grade levels, um, yeah. and if one of the the um, one of the systems or approaches that we're looking at differently at the lower grades is, is shared devices and what that could possibly look like as opposed to a one to one, and um, how manageable is that in the classrooms and. and um, and that's something that's been influenced by a variety of different factors, including some of the, the concern around screen time or, uh, you know, some of those other things. So, exactly. Yeah, exactly. so that's, that's... Maybe even, uh, you know, kind of like the office hours at right. each site, themed. you know, yeah. going to each site so that it's easier for parents to, you know, communicate with you both their love of it and their concerns about it. Yeah. Um, I, I do agree, a longer process for this would be yeah. the best. Can you come back and kind of give us updates? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Future okay. Future we haven't promoted yet. I know. Yeah. Well, I, I thought I was going to jump in. I was going to jump in. I was going to jump in. No, it's right. Okay. Yes. okay. All right. All right. So now we have a vote uh, to approve the consent. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, uh, do we approve the consent agenda by consolidating the motion? Aye. 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 <clears throat> okay. Action items. Administration human resources approval of the revised student attendance calendars for the 2020-21 school year and the 2021-2022 school year traditional schools. Yeah. Can we do all of these? No. no. One at a time. I'll move to approve uh, item 10.1.1. Second. Any discussion? It definitely looks more realistic for final schedule and just mm -hmm. for people that celebrate Christmas, which is a lot of people. Not running for right up against right. Christmas. Right. Yeah. yeah. Nice. The 23rd yeah. of December yeah. sounds horrible. So thank you, thank you for everybody for. Yeah. For working on that. Can I ask a process question? Sure. Yes. Just, yeah, just because I, I, mean, I thought the last one looked good. I like it. this one looks good. Uh, but uh, the parents had different feelings about it. And so can I ask about the process that Jerry did? Yeah, so I, well, I think, you know, first, this was a much bigger um, task than I was anticipating. <laughs> the calendar, the calendar committee. But um, I want to just acknowledge and thank that you know, we had CSEA representation at the, at the table. Um, PFT, we had a few um, of the vice presidents from PFT as part of the committee, a um, couple administrators, um, year-round principals, Amy Shadow was there, um, um, a couple of teachers from the year-round schools as well participated. And so we've had multiple multiple calendar meetings talking about this. We, um, I think the last one when we approved the traditional calendar, we got a lot of feedback from parents and, and staff. And I think, you know, fully admit that I think we were, and many of us on the committee, we were, we were very myopic as we were, we were looking at this calendar going, okay, there are many factors that we looked at, you know, I was always looking through student achievement and, you know, what's best for students, but then looking at it from the high school perspective and high school administrators and teachers saying, okay, how do we um, make sure that we balance these semesters out because, yeah. you know, an economics class, a semester long economics class in the fall needs to be similar length to one in the spring. Um, thinking about you know state testing as well and where how that how that's going to fall, um, so many many factors were going through our minds when we were, when we were looking at obviously looking at elementary perspective as well and how, um, um, so anyway, the reason we went back to look at it the biggest feedback we were getting was really around that winter winter break, and I think that um, it was you know I'll. Take ownership too. I should have caught that. You know, many of us on the committee said so we should we should have caught that, and um, so we wanted to bring it back and take a look at the um, what it would look like having that week off, which then looking at the semesters made us push the start back start right. date back a little bit, and frankly, it looked very similar to the calendar that we have this year. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. along those same lines, um, so the second the twenty 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 no twenty twenty one twenty two. Yes. Um, that pushes the start date, you know, later in August, and then we've got graduation. Exactly. 
So is that kind of what the trend is, is to go more towards a later start and a later graduation? Or um, did yeah, you just I mean, decide to do that? It's going to be, and just because of the, 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 have to have that extra the fires. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and there was concern too about making sure that we have enough time over the summer to get the schools ready, and yeah. um, so we looked at that and, and kind of getting getting ready to start back. And learn about, gosh, if we start if we start soon, you know, we're we're starting so soon in in August mm -hmm. that the teachers are coming back, you know, practically the first week of right. um, of um, August, right. and our staff are just coming back and. Our you know, yeah. head secretary and principal are just I, kind of catching their breath. They have issued so. a magic wand. So. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but an, an additional, so. additional challenge this year, for example, is when we end May 31st, our 10-month classified employees then don't work any days in June. Right. Mm -hmm. And that messes with retirement. Yes. Uh, so actually yeah. having at least one working day in June yes. for classified employees was also really important. Yes. So I mean... When he what? says we were looking at it from many lenses, that right. was another one. there was just there's just a lot to consider, and we learned that this year, when, and last year really, because I think we ended even did we work June first last year, but this year it's May thirty first, yeah. and we're still trying to figure out how do we deal with that whole issue because there's a lot of time on the plays that right. their last day is the last student day, and that creates a problem. Yeah. Right. Okay. So a lot of thought went into it. Many many perspectives are run into it. I think, but you know, I I shared with you in the in my email that. Mm -hmm. Um, having gone through this process once, I had some suggestions for how, how I would do it a little bit differently moving forward. And I think that um, you know, bringing in you know, student like and listening. parent yeah. uh, participation from the very beginning. And um, so, anyway. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All of you. Okay. Uh, so, um, all in those, all those in favor of um, approving the revised student calendar for 2020-21. Hi. Hi. Oh, for traditional schools. Sorry. Yeah. Um, all of uh, I need. I need to approve Thank you. Thank you. I'll second. <laughs> Discussion. Was it pretty much the same process with year round? So the year yeah. round, the year round was another um, opened up a whole another yeah. uh, kind of yeah. So Amy Schluter, yeah. uh, Maureen Rudder, who is sort of. Um, taking the place of Amy Fidage, so the two principals, uh, Penn, Penn Grove and Cherry Valley, were there. A uh, teacher from each of the sites as well participated, um, and we heard, you know, some a lot of good feedback from parents as well that we shared as part of the committee. And um, there's, you know, and then the other factors as well. We want we want to have the same end date as the rest of the district. Sure. We want to have the same um, one of the same weeks for spring break, then uh, our emergency closure dates, uh, winter break, want to be the same. So. Um, a lot of that conversation was, was went into it, but once you have the traditional calendar set, it makes it much more easy. Although, then there was um, the spring break, which came up, right. and from many parents' perspective, you know, having two weeks of spring break and plus a power emergency shutdown was a lot. Yeah. Cherry Valley and Pengrove had sort of slightly different opinions on that. Mm -hmm. We kind of, I think we came to a pretty good... Um, um, Compromise, yeah. and we have um, all, right? three days. We have a, a a week and three days the first that oh, first year, and a week there. and two days the next year because we had a lot. There was a lot of parent feedback. The two different sites had different views, and so we kind of came to a a slight compromise there. And there was also so, concern about the parent-teacher conferences, like running up against that too. Was correct. that and Pen Pengrove and Cherry Valley do that differently? Okay. So, yes. How do you come to that decision, Ms. Well, so um, Pengrove has their uh, two weeks of conferences on the front end because mm -hmm. they like to have an additional time on the intake side mm -hmm. of conferences. And it does kind of run up against one of their breaks, too, mm -hmm. the fall break, I believe. And so we have ours in the spring that runs up against our spring break. Mm -hmm. So that issue is, is present at both sites, just at different times of the year. We prefer to have our two weeks of conferences at the end because they're student-led conferences. It's an opportunity for students to come in and run a conference with their parents and show them what they have learned over the year. And, uh, you know, if you, every child wants to have their time, and every parent wants to have their conference, and it takes that amount of time to make sure everybody gets their, their door time. Um, so that's how it works. I think I heard, one well, thing I heard in the committee meeting yeah. was nobody yeah. likes the early release yeah. days for conferences. Yeah. But they do love their time with their teachers. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Sounds about right.
Good. Okay. Uh, so, do we uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Uh, I need a motion for the uh, approval of the revised Petaluma Adult School Calendar for 2020, 21, 21, 22 school years. So moved. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Yes. Cool. I don't have to do that again. No more calendars. No more calendars. that was complicated for like two months. Right? We're We're about so much calling much things. Like, the executive assistant HR will be very relieved. Yeah, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Yes. She's done seeing the calendar short. I'm sure. Very good. Good job. Okay, discussion information only. <coughs> Student services, new administrative regulation, um, removal of suspension record. And that's the same. It's just uh, the AR under the SQ for families and you know, slightly more information that ex expounds on the policy. And then the amended board policy, first reading of the amended board policy 5144. Right, that's that's a sentence in under the suspension section that now points to 511.4, which yeah. then gives all the detail that we discussed. Okay, so that's that's about the expulsion. Right, it's just okay. the one sentence again, but it just says, you know, in order to, it is possible to expunge it, please see this board policy for detail on that. Okay. And it just points to that, to what we discussed. Uh, as long as we're amending 11.1.2, um, I, I noticed the last time it was um, reviewed was a long time ago, I can't remember the year, mm -hmm. but uh, the word vaping doesn't show up, it seems like we can uh, address yeah, that at the same that time. Before. Right. What, what do you think? To add, well, so where vaping is is it's considered a controlled so it doesn't it doesn't show up in ed code either and no. ours mirrors ed code and it's just considered under a controlled substance which would be a okay five, you know a, a 48900 c i want to say so it, it ours mirrors ed code when it comes to the codes for which we can discipline so students but we have in our ar separately that we don't use suspension or ed code if it's nicotine, vaping, and in that section it does show up. Although I think it just says tobacco. Nicotine. It just says, yeah, I brought it up before. Yeah. yeah. So we could, I mean, can we, as part of the AR, we could go back and look at that AR that was yeah. revised. Yeah, it wouldn't be in the BP, it would be in the AR. It would be in the AR. AR. And okay. actually write the word vaping, vaping in that AR that was redone in June. That, that would be a, a change we could make. In BP, it's just a mirroring of ed code in the 48900s. Okay. Um, is that something you're interested in? In that AR actually saying where it says tobacco and nicotine? I think so. I think there's yeah. been enough consternation about no. where vaping falls. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yes. No, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, future business. You have future business. I do. Um, our book. <laughs> the due date is today, and I actually had um, questions for you all, but um, I left my book along with my glasses at home. Are we going to have a study session? Yes. Okay. So, um, so Gary has an information item that he's going to put on the agenda on February 4th. Yes. Um, for setting a date. She's more of that. So we can talk about it. So we can it. talk about it. For your calendars. Governor's core. Okay. It was due today, though. Oh, I was going to give you one of them. I don't know whether we can. Can we talk about it? Information on the business future business. The governance core. So, um, oh, well, I can talk to you. Um, and then Ellen will be here. So, um, if we can look at, we're, I'm sure we're doing like evenings or Saturdays. So um, if, if just come prepared, because I'm going to be gone in March. So, um, all right. Uh, and then, oh, I have to read. There's no need to adjourn to a, a closed session. So I have um, uh, an action on an item heard in closed session, uh, considering case number 53. A case has been presented to the board that a student did commit an expellable act as defined by the California Ed Code. 
prior disciplinary actions have been attempted and were not successful and or due to the nature of the act. The presence of the pupil causes a continuing danger to the physical safety of the pupil and others. The recommended motion is for the board to support the site discipline team's recommendation for expulsion in accordance to board policy and to facilitate enrollment in a county operated court and community school. The student's expulsion status will be in effect for the spring semester of 2019-20 and the fall semester of 2020-21 school year. Um, do I have a motion to approve? Move to approve the recommendation. Second. Uh, discussion? Well, we can't. We can't really. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And we are adjourned. Yeah. 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 Yeah.